Good morning. Thank you so much for coming. This is the last class before the spring break. For some of the students, this is the first or the second day of the spring break. <laughs> Don't feel bad because you came. So the class we have, the lecture we have today, focuses on another movie where we find a famous Machiavellian character, Tom Ripley. The movie is the talented Mr. Ripley. The movie we will see is The Talented Miss Ripley from 1999, directed by Anthony Minghella. But it's just one of several film adaptations of the novel, The Talented Mr. Ripley, that was published in 1955 by Patricia Highsmith, who went on to write, since the character was so successful, went on to write four more books before her death in the mid-1990s uh, with this same character. As usual, our goal is to analyze the scenes and try to interpret how Machiavellian really the character is. Is the character Machiavellian simply because he's performing some evil things, including crimes and crimes of, of extreme violence, or not? What do we find that represents an interesting reflection on Machiavellianism, in this case applied to the personal character and the life of a single individual? So we're more on the side of the psychological trait known as Machiavellianism, although there is also a noticeable amount of tricks and cons, scams, played by the character. The character in some way is a scamster, a con artist, okay? So I have a brief introduction, then we'll watch one segment of the film and uh, there should be time after a brief discussion for at least parts of a second segment. And as usual, we will continue on the Friday after the uh, spring break. Um, this time I'm not going to ask you to write notes on a piece of paper that I distributed, the, of the kind that I distributed the other time, but if either today or even later when you go home you put notes, reactions, comments about the movie in the Google Docs file that you shared with me where all the assignments have been placed that would go towards your grade in participation and would show your goodwill at coming on the, on the last day before the spring break, okay? So as I said, you can open the Google Docs file now during the viewing of the film, or you can just write a few notes and then transfer them on that file. That is where I will be going later to review your notes and leave my comments depending on what you wrote, as I did with the notes you wrote during The Godfather, okay? So let me tell you the story and then I'll discuss the character a little bit. As I said, the Screenplay is based on a book, but the film doesn't show how uh, Tom Ripley, the main character, grew up, the circumstances in <clears throat> his life before the beginning of the movie. From the book, we learned that Tom Ripley is an orphan who uh, grew up under the tutelage of an aunt who was really a cruel person who humiliated him. Uh, and as a young man, Ripley goes to live in New York City where he works a variety of jobs, including playing the piano at social parties. That's where the film begins. At the beginning of the film, we find Matt Damon playing the part of Tom Ripley playing the piano at a party for wealthy 
New York socialites. And he uh, is replacing a friend and he borrowed, because he's, he's too poor to have formal wear, the kind of formal wear you're supposed, even as a piano player, to have on at such a party with millionaires, he borrowed a jacket with the Princeton logo emblem on it, okay? So he's playing the piano, and at the end of the party, he's approached by the people who organized the party, uh, the Greenleafs, a, a, the father and the mother of a Princeton student, Dickie Greenleaf, and they tell Tom, oh, you went to Princeton, you must know our son, Dickie. And as, a, as the beginning of a pattern in the film, Tom Ripley, Matt Damon, hesitates a little bit, has this pause, which is kind of longish, and then he says, oh yes, sure, of course, yeah. And because of this connection, he is able to enter the circle of trust, and we'll talk about this diagram in a bit, is admitted into the circle of trust. So, first precondition to this admission in the circle of trust, he's being hired as the piano player for this party with wealthy people. Second condition, he wears a jacket that proves that he got admitted into a very elitist university. The movie takes place in 1958. As I said, uh, it, it postdates the event of the novel, which was published instead in 1955. So imagine what Princeton, how elitist Princeton would have been around the late, mid to late 1950s. So, uh, uh, the father of Mr. Greenleaf, the father of Dickie Greenleaf, has a proposition for Tom. He says, our son is in Italy, living a good life with his girlfriend, spending his allowance, and refusing to come back to the United States. Of course, uh, what Mr. Greenleaf has in mind is that his son, it's time for Dickie to learn the ropes to uh, take a position in the family business so that a proper transition from father to son can be worked on. And Mr. Greenleaf, Greenleaf says to Tom, if you go to Italy, find my son and talk to him and persuade him to come back, I would pay you a thousand dollars for your expenses they know from their conversation that Tom has never been to Italy. You, you'll have this wonderful trip. I'll give you a thousand dollars. I'll pay you the expenses for the trip. And you would do me a favor. After all, you know him. You, you're an intelligent, smart person. And Tom, of course, once again, hesitates and then says yes. Immediately, Mr. Greenleaf has this reaction that, oh, what a wonderful, what an extraordinary young man, right? Because if you're admitted in the circle of trust, then the presupposition is that you must be exceptional, right? Must be exceptional to go to uh, Princeton, to be the, one of the friends of my son, etc. So Tom takes a, a ship. It's the 1950s, so it's still fashionable, especially for the rich and famous, to take a cruise ship. Uh, first class ticket uh, to Italy, goes to this place where Mr. Greenleaf told Tom that he would find Dickie, the fictional village of Mongibello, especially fictional. He gets out of the bus in Mongibello and everyone is singing because it's Italy, right? And I know people are singing. When I was in Italy, I would go out of the house and start singing, right? I'm Italian, yeah. <laughs> Poets and singers, musicians at best. So he pretends to just walk into, Tom pretends to just walk into uh, 
Dicky Greenleaf on the beach. Uh, the, the movie was shot in, on the shores of Campania, so oh. in the vicinity of Naples. Some scenes were shot in Positano, others in Ischia. Beautiful. Yes, uh, although Minghella complained that the weather was terrible, that he was supposed to show Italy as a sunny place, a sunny paradise, and he was saying he was raining every day during the shooting of the movie. We would have to cut the scenes down to one line or two lines. We would shoot them, and, and then it became cloudy. We stopped, we waited for the sun to come out again, and we continued. But, for example, Jude Law, who plays the part of Dickie, was sent there months in advance to have a natural tan. Mm -hmm. And so this friendship begins, and this is more or less where we will stop. So uh, uh, Tom is able to befriend Dickie, and then I, I won't spoil for now the rest of the story. So keep in mind this, which is the, the most important part in, to, in, Machia, in terms of any kind of uh, Machiavellian interpretation for the first part of the movie. Keep in mind that when you consider the people around you, right, you have the largest circle, which is society, right? Anyone you come in contact through your social frequentations, right? Could be anyone from the people you meet at the supermarket where you go regularly, to uh, the people who, uh, whom you see at the university, let's say even your uh, professor right, or instructor at the university. And of course, within this circle, it's a circle, some will be at the margins, right, and others will be slightly closer to the next level. The next level being the circle of friends, right? And again, some friends will be more distant, some closer, and the boundaries, especially for the transition from the social circle to the circle of friends, the boundaries are porous, right? At some point, someone you know superficially might go from your social circle, be admitted into your circle of friends, okay? So this is what I represented here with this arrow. Within your circle of friends, you then have an inner circle, which you can call the circle of trust. Those are your closest friends, the friends you trust completely, okay? And it's easy to understand. What's important to understand is that the circle of trust is an ecosystem. It's dynamic. So, for example, to show the dynamic nature of the circle, if you are disappointed terribly by someone you had admitted into your circle of trust, a close friend betrayed you, a, a boyfriend, a girlfriend betrayed you, then you become more cautious, right? Then your circle of trust may shrink. And in fact, any of these circles, depending on the circumstances in your life, can shrink or expand, okay? And the amount of trust that I represented with this T and the arrows and the scale, the amount of trust you placed on anyone within your circle of trust changes, right? depending on your attitude. There is, however, another aspect to this that makes everything tricky, because if you take this, it, it's pretty linear, right? And you wouldn't think that this system can be tricked a lot, right? You have superficial acquaintances, you have friends who are more or less close to you, and then you're a few people, members of your family, close friends, that you trust a lot, and, and it seems, based on this, that it's easy to control the game. However, what makes this complicated is that when you take your circle of friends, you know, of course, that they themselves have a social circle, a circle of friends, and a circle of trust, right? And they may be your friends. The same is true for those you admit into your circle of trust. They themselves have a circle of trust, a circle of friends, a social circle that overlap. Usually they overlap partially with your own circles, but not completely. So at any point, there may be outsiders, people that for you are outsiders. Possibly you don't even know them within your social circles, but 
they're not regular outsiders if they're part of the circle of friends, the social circle, but more importantly, if they're part of the circle of friends of your friends or even the circle of trust of your friends. So for anyone there, even though they're an outsider to you, for anyone there, it is easier to enter your circle of trust because they meet some preconditions, right? And this is especially common among celebrities and important people. That is to say, if I go, uh, if, if I uh, uh, am walking on in the Hamptons and I see Francis Ford Coppola or Martin Scorsese, I can walk to them and say, Maestro, I have a script that I would like you to read. They'll say, oh, go away, you, you, you a-hole. Leave me alone, right? However, if I manage to get invited to a party in the Hamptons, and it's a small party especially, and I may be a complete outsider to most people there, but I am in the circle of friends of someone, and that's how I got admitted there, and in that small party, Martin Scorsese was invited, I, I can go to him and say, oh, maestro, I, I really admire your uh, white 488 Ferrari. And uh, after a while, after a short conversation, I might mention, you know, I have a script and I might get Scorsese to read the script. I, I actually saw Martin Scorsese once on Long Island on a white 488 Ferrari, wow. not too far from my house, uh, because he had some relatives in, in that area, wow. okay? So you understand that the same preconditions that worked in Tom Ripley's favor may work in anyone's favor, and simply by being there, simply based on the assumption that you belong to the social, the friends, the circle of trust of someone I trust, you can gain a lot of power, okay? You can have my trust, okay? So a jacket, in this case, even Ripley will say at some point, it all started with borrowing a jacket because the jacket with that emblem of the Princeton University is count kind of a voucher, right? It's vouching that Ripley himself is not just an outsider. He belongs to a circle which carries some uh, power. And later on, in one of the scenes with the green leaves, someone will say, the green leaf name opens a lot of doors, right? You come as someone that the green leaves, these millionaires are vouching for, so immediately you gain a lot of trust. You're not a simple outsider any longer. And what happens is that, as you will see, once Tom gets to Italy, uh, gets off this uh, uh, posh cruise ship and is in this customs area to pick up his luggage, someone, a woman, Kate Blanchett, playing the part of Meredith, approaches him, asks what his name is, and once again, Tom pauses just for a second and then says, I'm Dickie Greenleaf. Hmm. And based on that, of course, the attitude of the woman who is herself a heiress, the daughter of a millionaire, so he know she knows of the name of Greenleaf, what it represents, immediately she's friendly to him, okay? That's easy to notice. How does uh, Tom manage to gain the trust of Dickie? Of course, by saying we were at Princeton, but Dickie doesn't recognize him. He says, well, I don't remember you at all. And, and Tom will say, well, but I know you, so you must know me, right? Which is kind of uh, weak. However, what is that Dickie Greenleaf will say of Tom? He will say, he makes me laugh, right? So we see that from being an outsider, uh, slowly Tom turns into a social parasite, right? Someone who is not recognized as a peer, 
and Matt Damon plays Ripley as an awkward fellow to a fault. I, I, I don't really like the way Minghella had the part played by Matt Damon. I don't know if it is Matt Damon's intention uh, or, or the director's uh, directions. But it is true that what happens in the relationship between this millionaire uh, uh, spoiled brat, Dickie Greenleaf, and this poor boy from New York City who got by through a series of uh, menial jobs, Tom Ripley, the relationship is the kind of symbiotic relationship established by many social parasites around celebrities uh, to this day. That is to say, he makes me laugh and also because uh, Dickie Greenleaf has been rich through his whole life, he, he cannot find joy in his own wealth. He's bored, he's constantly bored. But when he gets to have to his side Tom, for whom everything, being in a Rolls Royce with a driver, being on a cruise ship, being in Italy, everything is new, everything is emotionally powerful, then someone like Dickie, can live this, those emotions vicariously. He can find joy in seeing this uh, poor boy having so much pleasure from simple things that for him are simple, like going to a jazz club, going to a restaurant, going for a trip to Rome uh, or to uh, San Remo. And then what is the conclusion that you will see uh, probably the next time? That at some point, Dickie, gets bored even of the new toy that Tom Ripley is. And at the end he will say, you are not in Princeton, right? We, and, and when Tom indirectly admits to it, confesses that, he said, oh, okay, we, we had a bad going between me and my girlfriend Marge uh, about that and I, uh, and I won. So, who is Tom Ripley? Certainly Tom Ripley, in terms of being a Machiavellian character is completely amoral, meaning that he will lie, cheat, even commit violent crimes, and, and there are some gory scenes in this uh, movie without any remorse, without uh, any effect on his conscience. That is established, uh, that is clear. However, is he intentional in his tricks? in his evil practices and behaviors. Not so much, at least in this version of the film. As I said, there are multiple versions. Five years after the book came out in 1960, you find the first adaptation, Purple Noon, for example. So there are many versions. In, in uh, one of the latest incarnation of this, you find John Malkovich playing Ripley. And of course, you know John Malkovich and as soon as you see Matt Damon here, you will, you will know that John Malkovich played the older Ripley in a more nuanced and sub, more subtle way. And you know now that, for example, if you remember that the TV, British TV series being shot now in Italy has Tom Scott, and again, Tom Scott, if you know him from Sherlock Holmes or other series or films, again, will play much differently from the kind of naive, awkward uh, interpretation of Matt Damon. But, but again, you, you may like it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's also a matter of taste, right? Or how you imagine the character to be. The only trace of uh, Tom being intentional is the fact that he learns from Mr. Greenleaf that Dickie is uh, a, a lover of jazz music something that Mr. Greenleaf, as, as a wealthy man, despises, right? He finds it too primitive. Uh, and therefore, before he leaves for Italy, he studies jazz. He learns uh, to recognize famous jazz players and jazz music, and then he will use that as a trick to stay in Mongibello when he's about to leave, because he hasn't connected really yet with Dickie, he goes there to, to, to say goodbye to him with a bag, and he has ripped uh, the, the stitches at the bottom of the bag. And so when he goes there for, uh, to, to squeeze his hand, to shake his hand, the bag opens and 
um, the the LPs, the discs, uh, uh, go uh, fall to the ground, and it's all jazz music. And immediately, Dicky lights up and says, "Oh, you 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 like jazz? You know?" And he has "Bird" by Charlie Parker. "Bird" mm -hmm. is the name of the sailboat of Dicky, and he says, "Okay, you have to stay. We'll go to a jazz club in Naples, and we'll play there." And Dicky plays the saxophone. So there is some preparation, some training, but not a lot really, not a lot of planning, you see. For the most part, and what I find the weak spot of the movie is that the character of Tom Ripley is seen as reactive. Yes, there are opportunities presented to him and he takes advantage of them, but really at the very last moment. And we know that his talents, Tom himself will say that his talents are his ability to lie, his ability to forge signature, his ability to impersonate people. But impersonating people should come with more intention, right? Meaning, if you're planning, you're studying a character and someone, to impersonate someone else, you also need a plan. And Tom doesn't really have a long-term plan. He seems to be living day by day. So, is evil, but is it really Machiavellian, okay? Keep in mind what I said, in real life, you find a lot of symbiotic parasites around celebrities. Those will be the people you see on TV always next to a famous athlete or a famous musician. Do they have anything to offer? They may be old friends, new friends. No, they're used almost like amulets. The artist, the celebrity, the athlete needs to have them by them as, as a psychological blanket of sorts, right? And, and they're used, they're kind of tools of these celebrities. They're not real friends or peers. They're not equals in most instances. And this is how also this mechanism, how celebrities are conned, are victimized uh, by con artists. And you find a lot of that, right? Athletes or celebrities who got millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars swindled by uh, uh, expert, able con artists who managed to enter their circle of trust. And once they were there, because they were part of their circle of trust, they gained trust that was misplaced. Okay, that's too much. So let's go to the very beginning of the movie. I like to show the beginning of any movie because otherwise you don't get the atmosphere, etc. <laughs> okay, so. This is the end of the first <coughs> segment. You see Tom working at impersonating Dicky with his voice, with the objects he finds around. Later on, he will put on his clothes as well. And you also get a hint of the sociopathic, psychopathic nature of the character of Tom Ripley. And in fact, after the spring break on the Friday of the eighth week, the next segment will have a, a different introduction because the first thing you will see will be Tom killing in a very gory, violent way, Dickie, and then taking over his life and his character, and we'll take it from there.